All right. Welcome, everyone, um, to our second day of our ACA Compliance Reports webinar. Uh, my name is Samuel Vickers. I'm an associate consultant here at Paragon Compliance. And as we get closer to the end of the year, we just wanted to put together a quick webinar for you um, to go through the main essential ACA Compliance Reports, um, some of the things to look out for, um, and as well as field any questions you have um, as we go through the reports. So first, I'd like to start off by going through um, essentially what we're trying to avoid, and that is the big large tax penalty the ACA levies against employers who fall below their 95% offer of coverage. So under the ACA, employers, over 50 full-time employees are expected to maintain a qualified offer of coverage to 95% of their ACA full-time employees. To be an ACA full-time employee, we at Paragon use the look back measurement method. Um, those are periods of time where we measure employees' average hours to determine their ACA full-time status. We use three methods to determine if someone is ACA full-time. If we're talking about a new hire who is designated as full-time in your system, and they have not yet completed a standard measurement period. Those individuals are classified as ACA full-time. We also have ongoing employees which have completed a standard measurement period and they've averaged at or over 130 hours per month on average in a prior standard measurement period. Additionally, we could have potential employees, part-time, variable or seasonal, that have averaged over 130 hours per month during their initial measurement period. The second penalty that we're trying to avoid is the affordability penalty. For 2019 plan years, the IRS has set a rate of pay safe harbor of 9.86%. Essentially, your lowest single cost of coverage cannot exceed this amount based on the following safe harbors. An employee's rate of pay, whether they're hourly or salary, W-2 wages, and the federal poverty line. We do recommend you use rate of pay safe harbor as it's the most uh, consistent way to measure affordability on the basis per year. Um, some of the negative impacts of W-2 reporting are you're not sure uh, an employee's earnings until very close to year end, which can make it very time constrained as we have to get the forms out to employees by January 30th. Uh, coming up, plan years in 2020, the IRS is actually lowering the percentage to 9.78%. What this means is the cost of insurance to be unaffordable is actually going to go down. So where a plan might be affordable at 9.86% for 2020, that may be unaffordable depending on an employee's uh, rate of pay or salary. The next slide is a review of measurement periods for ongoing employees. So in this example, we have a standard measurement period starting November 1st, 2016, running through October 31st, 2017. This is the 12 months where we look at an employee's hours and see where their average is um, to determine if they're over that 130 average hour threshold. Following that, you have an administrative period from November 1st, 2017 through December 31st, 2017. And this is the period of time the IRS allows employers to make your offers of coverage. Um, oftentimes it lands up, lines up with your uh, insurance renewal year, so that's during your open enrollment period. Following your administrative period is your stability period, January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2018. This is the period of time where employees are locked into their ACA status based on their hours worked during the standard measurement period. Going ahead, your next standard measurement period begins November 1st, 2017 and runs through October 31st, 2018. There's never a lapse or a time frame or gap during your standard measurement period. Once you finish one standard measurement period, your employees are tracked starting right on the first of the next measurement period. Once again, we have our administrative period and then our following stability period, January 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2019. And those ACA statuses are based on that standard measurement period beginning November 1st, 2017. In this next example, we have a new hire who's hired on April 14th, 2017. For this individual, assuming they're classified as part-time, they begin their initial measurement period starting the first of the month following the date of hire, May 1st, 2017, and runs 12 months throughout April 30th, 2018. 
For new hires, the IRS only allows a 30-day administrative period. During this time, if this employee has worked enough hours to be ACA full-time, coverage should be effective June 1, 2018, the first month of their initial stability period. And they are also locked into their ACA status from June 1, 2018 through May 31, 2019. Now, the main compliance report that I'd like to look at first is targeting that offer of coverage percentage. Remember, we want to maintain our 95% for every month uh, that we're going to be reporting on. Now, our offer of coverage percentage report gives you this percentage on a rolling 12-month basis. So when you receive your reports, you'll be able to go back into previous months and review your offer of coverage percentage. Keep in mind, we want to maintain our 95% for each and every month. This report provides your total ACA full-time employee count. This is going to include your full-time designated employees, your potential part-time variable seasonal ACA full-time employees that have worked enough hours during that initial measurement period, as well as all of your ongoing employees that have measured over 130 average hours over your standard measurement period. The next column over divides your uh, ACA full-time population, whether they are insured, whether they're opt-out, and then a resulting percentage of your opt-out and insured ACA full-time employees. The next column over identifies those individuals who are ACA full-time but have not received an offer of coverage. These are the employees that are actually counting against your offer of coverage percentage. And each and every month, our solution specialists um, will send out to you notes on these employees to determine if there is an error in their employer designation, if they were actually offered coverage, yet this was missing from your raw data files, or some other um, circumstance. We also have added additional columns this year that notes if you have any employees in their waiting periods. Since these employees are in their waiting periods, if coverage is offered at the end of those time frame, those employees should not count against your offer of coverage during their waiting periods. However, if you fail to offer coverage to these employees at the end of their waiting period, the prior months during the waiting period will count against you on your offer of coverage. Your final resulting percentage is all the way to the right, and in this example, we see this employer is maintained over 95% for each and every month. Once again, your solution specialist will identify any potential problem employees that may be counting against your offer of coverage and may offer suggestions as to a potential designation change based on the hours these employees worked or a potential for missing data um, in terms of their benefits. The next report actually breaks down those ineligible ACA full-time employees. It's called the Ineligible ACA Full-Time Report. So of those ineligible ACA full-time employees that are accounting against your offer of coverage, this report breaks down each employee and provides you with their position, their full-time, part-time designations, as well as their hire date, and reasons why we are determining them to be ACA full-time. In this example, the first three employees are employer-designated non-ongoing employee. These are employees that have been recently hired but are designated as full-time. As we reviewed on the first slide, uh, employer-designated ACA status is for full-time employees recently hired that have not completed their first standard measurement period. Down below, we have a part-time individual who has worked over 130 average hours per month during their standard measurement period. Some notes on this. Your solution specialist will once again uh, identify employees to you that may be potential for designation changes, but this is the group of individuals you'll want to review on a per-month basis to determine if in fact coverage was offered to these individuals or if there should be an adjustment to their employee type, um, position, hire date, etc. The next report is the affordability report. So this is tackling the 9.86% um, for the rate of pay safe harbor. In this example, we have three employees listed with their rate of pay amounts, what the rate of pay minimum is for their insurance, as well as what plan cost minimum is available for that employee. And these amounts are derived from the insurance tables you work on with your solution specialist. In the first example, 
The plan cost minimum for this employee is $262.15. And the lowest cost for this employee would be $153.82. For these employees, um, on a basis of a, on a monthly basis, we want to review to make sure their rate of pay amounts are correct, whether we're getting correct salaries or hourly rates in your raw data. Additionally, in order to trigger an affordability penalty, the following conditions must be met. We have to have an ACA full-time employee. They have to be ineligible or opting out of an offer of coverage that's unaffordable, but they have to go through the exchange and qualify for a subsidy and enroll in that exchange coverage. Our report is divided into two groups. We give you the ACA full-time employees as well as non-ACA full-time employees. The reason we give you the non-ACA full-time employees is if those employees were to become ACA full-time in the future, you would note ahead of time if there was an affordability issue for those employees. On the next slide, I want to take you through an example of how we calculate affordability as an example. For an hourly employee, we take their hourly rate multiplied by ACA full-time hours, 130, multiplied by the affordability rate to find the lowest costing plan to be affordable for that employee. In this example, we have an employee making $12 an hour. That gives them uh, $1,560 for the rate of pay amount. And multiplied by the affordability rate, this gives us $153.81. And that is the highest costing plan for single coverage that would be affordable for this employee. Alternatively, if we have a salary employee, we take the salary times the affordability rate divided by 12 to find the lowest costing plan uh, cost per month. In this example, we have an employee making $50,000 a year. Multiplied by the uh, affordability rate gives us 4,930. Divided by 12 gives us a per month figure of the highest costing plan for this employee. In this case, $410.83. And you can use this method to determine if uh, your new plan years, if your plans are going to be affordable for your employees or not. The next slide covers our new hire report. So these are employees that have not yet completed a standard measurement period. However, our report is tracking any ineligible new hire who is working at or over 130 hours per month. In this example here, we have an employee in their 10th month of tracking. They began tracking on December 2018 and will be tracked all the way through November of 2019. Now they'll have their 30 day administrative period in December of 2019. And then their ACA status will be locked January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Additionally, there are two additional employees in their second month of tracking. On a per month basis, you should review this report if you have any employees that are approaching their 12th month of tracking, as these employees will soon become ACA full time and potentially count against your offer of coverage percentage report if they are not offered coverage during their stability period. Additionally, your solution specialist will identify any employees that are approaching that 12th month mark and will let you know if you should extend an offer of coverage to these employees. The next two reports I'd like to cover is the initial stability report as well as the administrative period report. The initial stability period report ensures that coverage offered to new hire employees that have to have coverage maintained through their stability period are in fact maintained. This time frame can be different than your ongoing employee population, so it can be hard to tr uh, keep track of 12 different sets of new hires based on their hire dates. As you know, depending on the hire date and when the initial measurement period begins, you could have potentially 12 additional stability periods to keep track of with your new hires. The administrative period report is provided once per year at the end of your standard measurement period and lists uh, employees that must be offered coverage for the following stability period. Going back to our measurement period example, if we started a measurement period November 1st, 2017 through October 31st, 2018, this administrative period report would cover ACA status from January 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2019. So here is an example of our initial stability period report. For the first employee, we see there were hired 9-1-2018. Uh, 
and they were tracked from September 2018 through August 2019 with administrative period in September and following stability period in October 2019 through September of 2020. For this employee, you'd want to make sure you have an active uh, offer of coverage for this employee all the way through September of 2020. And this list is always divided in a per month basis for new hires. So the next grouping would have their stability period start September of 2019, following group in August 2019. Um, as always, it's good to review this report on a monthly basis and ensure each employee listed on this report is either enrolled, waived, or has that qualified offer of coverage. If you see anyone with an ineligible health plan, those would be items we'd want to review um, with your solution specialist. This next example is an example of our administrative period report. This report provides each and every employee that has worked over that 130 average hours per month during the standard measurement period. This report also includes any full-time employer designated employees you may have as well. Once again, this is provided to you once per year during the completion of your standard measurement period and provides you with a list of employees that should have their coverage maintained for the following stability period. In this case, this would be January through December. Keep in mind that all of these employees will go through their administrative period. In the example we talked about before, November 1st through the December 31st. So that gives you your 90 day window to make sure these individuals are offered coverage in time for the January 1st start of their stability period. This next report, eligibility report, tracks and maintains your ongoing employee population so you get a heads up on who's turning ACA full time in the coming months. In this example, this eligibility report runs from October 2018 through September of 2019. And the three individuals in the top category have exceeded that 130 average hours per month and will be listed on your administrative period as requiring an offer of coverage. This report also shows you individuals who are approaching ACA full-time hours, anyone who is working over 115 average hours, so less than 130, will appear in the second section of this report. This report lets you be able to plan and track employees as you go through your standard measurement period um, to maintain their ACA status, um, essentially kind of proactive planning um, for your administrative period. Um, if you have potential employees that are close to that 130, you can adjust hours if you want to avoid their ACA full-time status or let you plan appropriately for making an offer of coverage for those employees. The next report to be reviewed monthly is the insured under 120 hours report. Generally, we like to use this report to identify any employees who are potentially missing a termination date. As you can see in the first group of employees, we have three individuals that have an average service hours per month of 0.0, but they've been tracking in our system for 12 months. These are individuals you'd want to look through with your solution specialist to determine if we are missing a termination date that was missing in your raw data. Um, other potentials are leaves of absences, um, and we want to discuss with your solution specialist whether that is paid or unpaid. Additionally, this can be a cost-saving measure if you have employees who are not ACA full-time but are receiving offers of coverage in the second group. Some clients have collective bargaining agreements which require insurance be offered to these employees. However, if you're looking at it for a cost savings perspective, employees who are not ACA full-time may be eligible for some cost savings for the employer. We always have additional resources for you on ShareFile. Um, you can navigate to ShareFile to the Shared Documents ACA Documentation folder on ShareFile. We have a list of guides, um, some sample opt-out forms as well. Um, just going through the list, we have our report reference sheet, 
which shows you all of the reports you get on a monthly basis for ACA and STAR reporting, as well as some handy uh, what to do's on a per monthly basis for the, each of those reports. We also have a full guide on how to read your reports, which is a more detailed version of the reference sheet, which takes you through each and every report, what data fields are shown, and what actions you may take on a monthly basis. Additionally, we have our data file format specifications, our self-insured specifications. We have a guide to share file, sample opt-out forms, as well as a transmittal service guide. As always, if you have any questions on your reports, always feel free to reach out to your solution specialist. They'll be eager uh, and happy to help you through any questions you may have. And with that, uh, I'd like to open it up to any questions um, anyone has on any of the reports that we've gone over, um, or if you have an additional ACA question, please feel free to, to chime in. Uh, Sam? Yes. This is Paula from the Town of Brighton. <clears throat> um, could we go back and look at the differences between your initial measurement period, your ongoing and the stability, and talk about the differences for new hires? Um, when will they actually fall into our standard measurement period? Sure, great question. So I'm gonna bring back our example for a new hire. So in this example, uh, we have the employee hired on April 14th, 2017. So we've measured them on the basis of their initial 12 months. However, in this case, we don't have data going back um, for the full standard measurement period. However, once we look ahead to this new hire's initial stability period, during this time, they would have completed a standard measurement period, essentially November 1st, 2017 through October 31st, 2018, for example. So once that initial stability period ends, where they were locked into that ACA full-time status, uh, beginning June 1st, 2019, that ACA status would be determined by the prior standard measurement period. So essentially, once this employee completes their initial measurement or uh, initial stability period, they begin their standard stability period, which is hours based on the standard measurement period they completed during their initial stability period. So this employee would in fact become then ongoing after their initial stability period beginning uh, June 1st, 2019. Thank you. Sure. And, and also on the, um, the coverage, um, the single coverage for the lowest, the most affordable plan, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that's only for single, correct? If we offer family coverages that are substantially more expensive, it's really only we're looking at the single plan. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. The IRS is only concerned about the lowest single cost of coverage. Um, so as an employer, if you're offering, you know, up person up to family coverage, those amounts uh, don't come into play. It's only for the single rate. Okay, thanks. Um, kind of as an additional piece of information. So the line 15 on your 1095C for your employees actually shows that lowest single cost rate. Um, and once again, this would be reflective of the insurance tables you work on with your solution specialist during your plan renewals. Um, so we always design those tables with the lowest single cost of coverage. And one additional side note to that as well, um, if you have employees that do enroll, happen to enroll in that two-person or family coverage, that line 15 amount will still be that single plan cost. Uh, any other questions?
All right. Um, once again, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, as always, if you have any ACA questions, uh, feel free to, to talk with your solution specialist. Um, if you have any other ideas for topics you would like us to cover in a similar format, you can send a note to our uh, client services email below. Um, as always, thank you very much for attending. Um, and we'll be sending out a copy of this presentation along with this recording. Um, so if you ever wanted to refer back to it, that will be available for you. Once again, thank you very much, everyone.